Today on the show, we're diving deep into the starfighter uses and tactics of the Star Wars universe. Red group, gold group, all fighters follow me. All squadrons report in. This is Jaden of Gold Squadron, and on in attack position is my co-host Connor. That's right. Uh, I'm standing by. Proton torpedoes are locked and loaded. Let's do this. Oh yes, no <laughs> proton bombs, please. They float too much. <laughs> Welcome to Lore Party, the podcast that explores the stories, characters, and universes of our favorite video games. And uh, yeah, we're we're taking this one back to a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> Absolutely, it's been a long time. Since we've been able to talk Star Wars, nothing really happened recently for us to talk about, except for the new Star Wars video game. Star Wars Squadrons came out uh, a couple of months back, and we've finally gotten it around to tackling it. That's right. It was a it was a really fun game. Honestly, I you know I, I was excited about it first time I heard about it. You know, just thought, oh man, it'll be like the space combat from Battlefront Two, but on its own and kind of more uh, developed. And yeah, you know, they really leaned into that fantasy of like, oh, you're that pilot, you're you're surviving these white knuckle dog fights with, uh, with your opponents and, you know, having your buddies back you up in a team based situation. It's really cool. It's a good time. Absolutely. I really did feel like they got the, the flying aspect of it. Right. Cause I felt like, I don't know how you felt about it, but in battlefront two, it kind of felt like I was strapped to the front of a rocket and didn't really have much control over sure. where I was yeah. going. And the, but the, the, the starfighter, uh, just flying feels so, good in this version of it it feels like the old it's a little bit faster like the old rogue squadron games but or the old x-wing games on pc but this definitely feels really good to fly you really do feel like you're in a cockpit absolutely especially if you have those 800 hundred dollar flight sticks which i do not have. <laughs> maybe one day maybe, maybe one, day, one day yeah but no it's it, they, it the heart and soul of squadrons is really just that that starfighter feel just being in the cockpit and feeling your machine and uh it's it's all about the fighters in that game which is really cool but the story mode of the game which i enjoyed again i think you you know we we both enjoyed the campaign of star wars squadrons but what we're here to talk about today specifically is uh some questionable fighter tactics uh that the game's campaign sort of uh centered around that uh we have some issues with (laughs) but but, but the, before you before you worry, uh, this is not one of those pedantic nerd rants, you know, where we're kind of like pulling our fedoras down over our eyebrows and going, "Well, actually, that wouldn't work." <laughs> That's not it's, what we're what we're going to try and get into is like how even from the perspective of the movie based canon and uh, other games and just other instances from the Star Wars lore, even from that perspective, the fighter tactics in Star Wars Squadrons. Uh, we're not very. It's a little silly. We're not sound. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're a little. They're a little silly. This, like he said, this is not going to be a meh, Disney Star Wars bad. Okay, m- maybe a little, <laughs> but uh, it's not not for the majority of it. Um, yeah. I think uh, first we do need to do a little background on what's going on in the game. So Star Wars Squadron takes place uh, after the fall of the Empire, after the Battle of Endor itself, and. The Rebel Alliance is no longer the Rebel Alliance. They're actually transitioning into what's known as the New Republic. Yeah, they went legit. They did, which is hilarious to me because they're like, they're like, hey, we're we we exist now. <laughs> we're we're the real deal. Which is really funny because there are instances in the game when you talk to your squad mates and they're all just like, uh, like uh, the 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 Transocean pilot. He's mm-hmm. just like, yeah, I used I used to be able to smuggle whatever I wanted, but now that we're legitimate, I could get in trouble. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Imperials are running amok, mm-hmm. trying to regain control, any sort of control that they can on the galaxy at large, even though everything's kind of unraveling right. on them, which which we will talk about. Um, we're not going to get super far into it because it's no longer canon, but we do need to talk about the EU a little bit and talk about the differences between the timeline of the old canon versus the new canon, because there are some drastic differences. Right. But the, the, I guess the main takeaway there is just that, like, at, at this point in the timeline, or at least this version of the timeline, like you said, Jaden, it's like just the New Republic, formerly the Rebel Alliance, is on the uh, is on the rise. They're gaining in power. The Empire is yes. uh, declining. So, like... 
a meteoric rise and decline at the same time. Exactly. So they're, they're meeting in the middle a little bit where the power levels are roughly even like it's, it's, it's now a fair fight, which yes. is pretty interesting. It's very interesting. But uh, as we know, the Rebel Alliance was never really able to go toe to toe with the Empire. What with their smaller ships? Right. Which is why they had to change it up a little bit. Connor, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah. When we meet the main characters and sort of the main the main conflict of the Star Wars Squadrons campaign mode, we see that the New Republic is kind of having this new initiative. They're in the process of designing and building a new prototype flagship called Project Starhawk. And the idea behind Starhawk is that this is like the new, like the way that the Star Destroyers sort of exemplified and symbolized the Empire. Mm-hmm. Starhawk will do that for the New Republic, and it'll be yes. big, imposing, powerful, capable of going toe to toe, like we said, and defeating Imperial Star Destroyers. So it's uh, th- that's what the story mode kind of revolves around, and we see that uh, conflict from both sides of the war, kind of like the Imperial perspective, the New Republic perspective, and we get into the human elements of both sides of that conflict. Which again, pretty cool. I like that. Mm-hmm. Like, long story short, the Empire does not want Project Starhawk to go forward. So that's that's where the conceit is. It's just, uh, as the New Republic, you're trying to complete this project as the Empire trying to stop it. And in the process of that conflict, you know, like advertised, Star Wars Squadrons is kind of all about the squadrons, the squadrons of fighters. You spend most of the game in the cockpit of a wide variety of ships. You know, when you're playing as the New Republic characters... You have access to, obviously, the classics like the X-Wing, the A-Wing, the Y-Wing, even the U-Wing, the kind of... uh, The newer ship. Yeah, the newer one introduced in Rogue One. So, uh, And, of course, on the other side, you've got the TIEs, the TIE Fighter, TIE Interceptor, TIE Bomber, and the TIE Reaper. But, uh, yeah, so you have access to all these different types of ships, and, you know, you kind of choose which one you want to use on each mission. Sometimes the mission will require you to fly a certain one, Mm -hmm. but other times you have the option. And, of course both in the game and in the canon alike, you know, on both sides of it, uh, there are different strengths and weaknesses to each type of fighter. They have different top speeds, different uh, shield strengths, different hull thicknesses, different Different payloads. Different loadouts. Exactly. And this is all really important. Like, you have to understand how different each ship is from the others. Like, they are good at different things. And that's important, right, Jaden? Like, what they can do in in a situation like that? Absolutely. You just have to realize a special, you know, just like in our real world military, you know, you wouldn't send uh, a fighter to do a bomber's job and vice versa, because you need to have the, the 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 ship has to be specific to the mission that it's carrying out, which Vanguard Squadron is different because uh, instead of having 12 ships of the same ship, it is a squadron that is literally just a mismatch. There's just yeah. a bunch of the different types of ships all smashed together into one abomination for lack of a better word (laughs) right i think one one really important thing to understand about this topic is uh that there's this concept of mission profiles a starfighter or in in like the real world parallel in our lives is you know aircraft uh fighters and bombers they have different mission profiles things that they are able to achieve in combat and you mentioned vanguard squadron vanguard squadron is the squadron of uh, fighters that you play as on the new new republic side yeah and uh, their sort of their opponents on the opposite end of the of the war is titan squadron from the empire and in both cases both vanguard and both titan and titan they always deploy on each mission like you said jaden in a mismatch like vanguard will have maybe two x-wings an a-wing a y-wing and a u-wing and yep. titan will similarly have like a two tie fighters an interceptor a bomber and a reaper so it's all just, it's scatterbrained. And uh, that gets us into sort of uh, our, the main thrust, our main argument here. That's a bad idea. <laughs> just, yes. Like, so there's a serious flaw in this thinking, which is outside the confines of this game, like if you look at the canon, the Star Wars canon, and most of the instances from the movies or the books or whatever, fighters will get quickly picked off and shot down when they can't match each other's speeds, match each other's capabilities. In squadrons, it's fine because, you know, in that game, if you get shot down, you just respawn and you just come yep. back in. It's fine. Like the same five fighters just kind of keep respawning. So it's not a big deal, but it doesn't work that way in kind of the entire 
rest of the canon. Uh, to bring it back to one of the old canon books, I'm going to be referencing the Star Wars X-Wing books a lot. And one of the things, and I, again, I know they're not canon anymore. Get off my back, Disney. <laughs> but um, they do give us a great amount of insight into what life as a squadron pilot in the Star Wars universe is. And until you know another book comes along that adequately tells that story, I'm going to use it as canon. I know Alphabet Squadron exists and the books are, you know, they're, they're good books, but they're, they're not as detailed in my opinion as the X-Wing books. Anyways, sure. um, they, there's a sequence where they talk about uh, logistics and logistics is one of the most boring things in all military doctrine that you, you know, you see and you go, Oh God, I don't care how yeah. many ration packs, you but it is the most important thing. In fact, um, many historians will tell you that World War II was only won because of the Jeep and the truck. Because they were able to get the supplies to the front lines fast enough. Yeah. Logistics and, aren't what you see action movies made out of, but that is what wins wars. Absolutely. Exactly. And the rebellion who, you know, who the New Republic was, they were strapped for just about everything. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a sequence in the X-Wing books where they're complaining about getting engine parts because they're building a new fleet and they're like oh my god why did you have why did you bring all these new ships in here there's no way i can get enough parts for all of them now imagine that for an entire operation that was one squadron <laughs> right so imagine the rebellion was like we're just gonna for a whole fleet screw it the entire fleet you just uh, you pick your ship and you get to fly it buddy whatever <laughs> it would be a nightmare and keep in mind a lot of these fighters that the new republic used were built by different manufacturers like, yes. uh, so the parts aren't standardized. Like the, there's no standard, uh, template of, you know, of just a mechanical basis that they all operate off of. I mean, look at the B wing, my God, we don't even, <laughs> let's not even get into the B wing. Cause that's like, you I know, think we talked about this too, where it's like a human engineer who's been assigned the B wing needs to immediately be put on suicide watch. <laughs> Cause yeah, the B wing is powered by some sort of, uh, Mon Calamari space magic that makes, you know, oh my God, yeah. rebel flagships so formidable and so iconic. They also are the people who built the B-Wing. And yeah, like oh. you said, Jaden, good luck to a human mechanic figuring that shit out. Like, there's no way. And like, if you also, if you have to service a B-Wing on top of, you know, X-Wing, a Y-Wing, an A-Wing, a U-Wing, all of which need different parts and different yeah. skill sets to maintain, that's a logistical nightmare. But, uh, but no, that, we're, that's, that's the logistical side of things. But, uh, I think we'll need to take a closer look at sort of the tactical level, the battlefield scenarios where I think so. Let's say, for example, I mean, it's, Ooh, paint me a picture. <laughs> I'll paint you a picture. We're playing Star Wars squadrons, right? And Vanguard squadron deploys from their MC 80 flagship. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're flying like two X wings, a, a wing, a Y wing, a U wing, a mishmash. And in the game, that works out fine because on paper, the theory is that, oh, this this deployment gives them maximum versatility. You know, you have the speed of the A-wing, you have the firepower of the Y-wing, you have the support utility of the U-wing, you have the versatility of the X-wing. But in real life, in, in, if well, not real life because we're talking about a video game, but if you, if you kind of uh, take a closer look at the mechanical limitations of each fighter – uh, the different top speeds and the different degrees of maneuverability mean that all the different ships within that group will struggle to keep up with each other. The slower Absolutely. ones. Yeah. If you're all approaching the same target, kind of from the same vector, the slower ones, like, like the Y wing or the U wing, they could fall behind and get picked off because they'll be sitting ducks. The faster ones, they might speed ahead. The A wing, the only advantage that it has is speed. Is speed. Right. If it gets hit, it's dust because it has barely any armor. So it has to move fast all the time or it's a goner. Like imagine, imagine this scenario. So imagine you're in the A wing and I'm in the Y wing. Right. And you're flying, we're both flying in the exact same direction at, at a squadron of TIE fighters. Mm -hmm. You are just fast enough to get killed. And I am just slow enough to watch you die. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm like, I'm going to pedal to the metal. I'm going to gun the engine, go straight at him. And I don't have you to back me up because I've left you, you know, a whole parsec behind or whatever. That's a, I don't know, a whole light year behind me or whatever. And yeah. I get, I get blasted and you have to watch because you're way behind me. Yep. And that's why we have also the different weapon loadouts. The different weapons that each type of fighter is able to carry means that it's more, it's better suited for different targets. Like 
you know, interceptors, naturally, they are effective against enemy fighters, bombers mm -hmm. more so against hard targets like capital ships and space stations, etc. What this means, though, and this is important, if a squadron's a mishmash like Vanguard is, then that means it does not have a specifically defined goal or mission mm -hmm. profile in terms of targets they can effectively engage. And that kind of like, uh, it kind of makes me wonder, like, what is the point of five different types of fighters, this, this group of different types of fighters with, with different capabilities? Like, I, I guess the thinking is they're flexible. They can do anything, but they won't do that anything well, though. That's the problem. Exactly. I think that obviously the, the, the out of universe explanation is that they want a hero, you know, or, or fantasy fulfillment of flying whatever ship you want. Sure, sure. But in, in canon, uh, the explanation seems to be just like that Vanguard Squadron is so, and Titan Squadron also, they're just so good at what they do is right. that they can, that they alone can take on problems that huge fighter squadrons can't handle. Right. But at the same time, you're really setting them up for failure when you're sending them out with such a bad mismatch and just, there's only if if like if this was a if this was a, a wing of fighters that was mismatched, which uh, they did they did experiment with that in the old EU. There was a there was Rogue Wing instead of Rogue mm -hmm. Squadron, mm -hmm. which was a mix of three different squadrons of mixed fighters. Which you know that worked, but that also was because there was you know thirty some ships in right. that squadron or right. in that wing, and so it's like there was so there was still you know a trio of X wings, a trio of Y wings, right? But if if you're like in Vanguard or Titan. And someone takes out your bomber, like the one bomber in your in your squadron, then <laughs> you're screwed if a, you uh, are you done. Know, an Architens class cruiser or you know a Gazanti or whatever shows up, and you know you don't have the bombs to take it out because your Y wing got shot down because it was too slow to keep up with you. And yep. if you only have the one A wing to intercept enemy fighters, then you don't have an escort if that gets blown up. So it is a numbers game, like you said. Like I think that's a great point, Jaden. You're making the point that. Variety is a good thing if you have the numbers for it. Absolutely. If variety doesn't count for anything if you only have five ships. <laughs> like that doesn't give you the flexibility you need to make it worth it. No. Okay, we're going to take a quick break here, but stick around. We'll be right back. We interrupt this podcast with a message from a different podcast. Hello, my name is Lawrence, a producer and host here on Lore Party, and I'm here to talk to you about our Last of Us 2 series. With humanity's last chance at a cure now seemingly gone, the world continues down its dark path. But nevertheless, life moves on, and now adult Ellie must confront the ghost of Joel's past, all while dodging religious cults militant revolutionaries, and her own inner demons. Tune in to our Last of Us series as my co-host Leo and I discuss the ultimate moral questions the game posits, the characters caught in this conflict, and AHA's hit single, Take On Me. Just hop on over to our Lore Party feed and search The Last of Us 2. Well, that's enough from me. Back to your show. Uh, I think it's time we get to the evidence. Let's back up our argument. Yes, concretely uh, here, Your Honor. I'd like to present Exhibit A. <laughs> uh, we're gonna we're gonna go in through. We're gonna transition from the video games into the established canon of the Star Wars universe. So, if you're only here for Star Wars Squadrons, uh, thanks for watching. <laughs> but no, 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 don't listen. But to them. For Stay those with of us. you hardcore nerds <laughs> like myself who love the the EU and the old and the new canon equally, you're gonna love this part. Um, Connor, why don't you hit us with our first example? Sure, we will do. One way, one place we can start at, and we can start kind of at the beginning. Let's go back along the timeline to one of the earliest examples of uh, quote-unquote proper <laughs> fighter tactics from Star Wars, uh, which is the Malevolence arc from the Clone Wars cartoon. Very popular series this Clone Wars show was, and actually, like, kind of season one, kind of right off the bat, they start with this they start with this really cool arc about the separatist flagship, a prototype separatist flagship called the Malevolence that yes. was a dire threat to Republic operations. And it was a big deal. 
and it's a uh, it's actually a direct parallel to the to the German battleship Bismarck that was launched during World War II. It was a super unkillable battleship that was the ultimate pride of the German Navy. It was the, the biggest battleship on paper. It couldn't be defeated by any other ship in ship to ship combat. But then it was defeated by bombers. <laughs> Who would have thought? But yeah, like that's a great point. Uh, the malevolence was such a big deal that. Yeah, they had to sort of uh, change the game up a little bit and pull out all the stops to uh, defeat the malevolence. It was that big of a deal. And so who do they send? None other than Anakin and Obi-Wan and other Jedi Masters. I think Pl- uh, Plo Koon was there, too. Uh, Plo Koon was there. Don't forget Snips. Oh, of course, Snips. Yeah, obviously she was there. <laughs> Good old Snips. <laughs> but the and, and like in real life, when the Bismarck was destroyed, the malevolence was only able to be stopped thanks to the clever use of fighters and bombers. And so, basically, you you might think the Y wing was only uh, around during the Galactic Civil War with the Rebel with the Rebel Alliance. Not true. Nah, man, that ship is old. The Y wings are old AF. They were around during the Clone Wars, and the clones used them. So that was pretty cool. I, I didn't I didn't know that one before I first watched Clone Wars. So that was pretty absolutely neat. those, and that's even from the old canon too. That these ships are ancient. But no, that like, you know, as janky and old as they were, the Y Wings were the key. But also part of the key was, again, numbers, dedicated groups of bombers, dedicated yes. bomber squadrons, like not just let's send five fighters and maybe one or two of them as a bomber and we'll take out the malevolence. No, <laughs> you needed dozens and dozens of Y Wings in coordinated squadrons uh, to do the job, to take out the malevolence. But on top of that, those bombers needed escorts. So you needed uh, similarly coordinated and dedicated groups of fighters, V-wings, to make sure the Y-wings were able to deliver the ordnance and kill the malevolence. Yes. So that's that's one of the earliest examples we can see in the canon of uh, fighter tactics taking on that sort of real-life flavor. You know, in real life, it is a numbers game. You have to send the right number of fighters to do the job. Y-wing bombers swarming the malevolence with explosives was what was needed, but you also needed coordinated, dedicated groups of V-17 Torrent fighters to make sure the Y-wings got there intact. So e- even in this early example from the canon, we can see that uh, fighter tactics in Star Wars, it doesn't cut it if you just send five random ships and <laughs> hope that their versatility does the job. Vanguard Squadron would be a lovely picture on a wall somewhere if they had to charge the malevolence and take it out by themselves. Exactly. But moving on, I think uh, there's an example that uh, sort of um, it it might seem like it uh, goes against our argument here, but it actually doesn't. And that's that's from uh, the original trilogy, right? Yes, uh, that would be the Battle of Yavin. Mm -hmm. Uh, During the Battle of Yavin, we see a a huge squadron of Y-Wings and a huge squadron of X-Wings. And now you're probably saying to yourself, well, Jaden and Connor, you idiots, Uh, the X-Wings are the ones that ended up doing the bombing run. And I would say, well, listener, you idiot. They only had to do that mission because the Y-Wings were so terrible. They all got killed. That's right. The uh, the original plan that the Rebel Alliance had to destroy the Death Star was that Y-Wings were going to be making the trench run. That's right. the, The famous trench run that Luke Skywalker made at the end of episode four. He used the It was force. never his job. It, it wasn't supposed to be his job. That's right. Gold Squadron was composed of Y-Wings, Y-Wing bombers. They were the dedicated bomber group. And Red Squadron, which Luke and Biggs and Wedge were all part of, they all were flying X-Wings. Their job was to escort. Again, you have this instance of dedicated bombers, dedicated escort fighters. They know their job. They have a specific job that suits the fighter they're flying. But like you said, Jaden, no plan survives contact with the enemy, unfortunately, and uh, all of no. Gold Squadron were shot down on the way to the Death Star. So it fell yeah. to Red to Red Squadron to make the trench run. And who was left of Red Squadron, too. Right. Because that, that, oh, God, that fight, there was mass casualties. What, four fighters made it away from yeah, the whole thing? it was pretty bad. Yeah. Including the Millennium Falcon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was ugly, but it had to be done. That Death Star had to go. <laughs> And I, I know what I know what people are thinking, too. You know, there's a huge example that we're leaving out, and it's the Battle of Endor. Yeah, let's talk about Endor. So the deal with Endor is very simple. Um, 
you know, everyone always says, well, how come I saw so many ships, you know, flying around in Endor together? Here's the thing. When the Imperial fleet ambushes the rebels at the second Death Star, the rebels were literally throwing everything that they had into this fight. The original plan, you know, you, you know, you, the Lando has the famous line, a uh, red group, gold group, all fighters follow me. They did it. He's not doing that. You know, the, the, the reason he's not, the reason all those fly, fighters are flying in there is not because like, oh, that was the plan. That was literally all they had left. Right. During that battle, they were not grouped into squadrons. They were grouped into what's called groups, which are bigger than wings. They are essentially, you know, squadrons that they can be anywhere from 40 to 80 fighters. Mm -hmm. And when you see, you know, when he says red group and gold group, come, you know, come follow me, it's like six ships because that's all that has survived the fight of the, of the previous like hour or so. Right. You know, you see in the, during the battle, you see like Y wings flying by themselves and X wings flying by themselves. That's because their wingmates are fucking dead. (laughs) Basically, this was a desperation move. This was not the original. plan. Absolutely. The battle plan for the battle of Endor was not, we're going to have a ragtag group of random different fighters just fly into the core. No, there were huge extenuating circumstances. Like another example of that is, you know, Lando advising Admiral Akbar, hey, bring the fleet, bring the rebel fleet in closer to the enemy fleet. Like get up next to the Star Destroyers and engage them at point blank range because that might give us some cover from the Death Star that's shooting its giant planet killing freaking laser at us. So the Battle of Endor can be defined by extenuating circumstances <laughs> yes and chaos absolute chaos and desperation moves absolutely so to pull an, a lesson out of uh, the malevolence arc the battle of yavin the battle of endor is that when you're deploying fighters in coordinated groups you need to have specific objectives for them and they need to be able to accomplish those objectives together in numbers it's a numbers game and you know, they, they need to have the same capabilities as their wingmates so that that job can be accomplished effectively. Absolutely. To bring it back home to to squadrons, though, yes. um, to be fair to the game, like I, I do want to say it's a great game. I really oh, enjoy it's an amazing game. The conceit of it. Like, like we talked about how it really captures that pilot feeling. And that's that was the point. And the place that Vanguard Squadron and Titan Squadron both occupy in the lore is that idea of you are the pilot, pick your ride, you know, pick the ship you, you are want. The squad. Yeah. And it's, it's a close knit thing. Like I think five characters, including the playable one who does, isn't really a character, but you're, you're, it's, it's a stand in for you as the player. Exactly. And the point of that five characters is to make it feel personal. And I get that. So, you know, not to, not to knock squadrons, uh, presentation of the star Wars, fighter experience uh it's just that when you compare it to the rest of the canon it doesn't hold up strategically yes. but that's okay you know it's it's just a game where you know you're shooting down other fighters and it's it's still fun i i think basically what we're saying is if you wake up in the star wars universe don't expect to be able to to have your buddy fly a y-wing while you're flying an a-wing most likely the two of you are going to be flying the same ship yeah Jaden, what fighter would you fly in oh boy i have been thinking about this question since I was four years old <laughs> and been waiting my whole life for this. Our, I, I think, I think our audience is going to just, just destroy us on our picks, but <laughs> I will go down in a blaze of glory. When I say that, I think the Y wing is the best ship in the star Wars universe. Ever since I was six years old and I fired up star Wars, uh, rogue squadron on the N64 mm-hmm. and the guy comes on and he goes, <laughs> Ah, yeah, the Y-Wing. It's not fast or flashy, but it gets the job done. Oh, yeah. It was the workhorse of the rebel. And I'm just like, I'm like, oh, man, I feel bad for this thing. And I, I, then I'm flat. I'm like, no, this thing is great. Like, it's got the, <laughs> it's a tank. It loves, you know, you can take the damage. It's not fast. The game's right. It's not fast. But it, I don't know. I love the fact it's got ion cannons on it. I can disable the ship and I can bomb the hell out of it. Mm-hmm. And I just, I love the look of it. It just, it looks like. It looks like a, you know, a ship in the universe. It's just, it's just, it's, it's got, it's two giant engines strapped onto a T-frame and they just, right. It just looks like a, it looks, it has like that weird rocket ship look to it. And I'm just like, man, I love this thing. Yeah. And I, I think that the Y-Wing pilots are the bravest mother, mother effers on the planet, man. <laughs> Cause they get wiped out all the time. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, it's hard to say who has who has just more uh, more more balls, the Y wing pilots or the A wing pilots, because A wings, you know, birth in armor, like ridiculously fast. You got to be crazy to fly one of those things. They're like a little, you know, it's cramped cockpit. If you make one wrong adjustment, if you steer one wrong degree. Or you steer in the wrong direction, you smash into an asteroid. It's scary. don't even get an astromech droid for company. Exactly, but but no, the Y wing is a great pick. I love the Y wing. It's a oh yeah, it's it's boxy looking. It looks ramshackle, but it's it has the guts and the the grit to just blow shit up. Absolutely, is, hell yeah. What about you? It's a great question, uh, but if I, it, it's hard. It's hard to pick one, but I think my personal favorite is. Probably the uh, the U wing, honestly. Uh, ah, someone's a fan of the Vietnam War. <laughs> you got me. No, it's <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a Huey, like a Huey helicopter. But uh, it's it, more than that, though. I just I like the idea of like transporting my buddies and you know being the support ship and sort of just swooping down and rescuing and you know it's it's got guns too. It can put up a fight. You know, it's like. It's it, it's sleek too. Like it's a little boxy. It has like that transport look. It's got a weird elegance to it. I will. Say. Yeah, it's elegant. Like it has a little bit of boxiness to it because it's like you can tell that it's a transport. Like you can haul people. It's it's like you could almost live in it if you had to, which is great to me. I, I like that idea of you know this is my ship, but it's also my home. But on top of that, like the 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 wings that sweep back, they're really sleek and awesome. I don't know, just. When the U-Wing was introduced in Rogue One, that was, like, one of my favorite parts of that movie. I just thought, that ship is really cool and how it can, like, swoop down and drop off troopers and uh, has, a, has that, like, door-mounted gun that you can do fly-by, like, air support with. It's so neat. I just... The U-Wing is just so cool to me. Well, that about wraps it up. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please take a second to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us grow the show. Be sure to connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at lore underscore party. And check out our YouTube page for bonus videos and highlights. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.